Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 21 to understand Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, and 39. You have to understand that Jesus believed and taught and predicated his teaching on the reality that Israel had a prophetic future, a, a part of God's future plan that was written about majorly in the prophets. So this is what Jesus was saying after he talks about what we would consider to be the, the events that are around the tribulation. But in Luke 21, he talks about Jerusalem being destroyed. Verse 20 is the destruction of Jerusalem. And then it says, 21, let those who are in Judea flee. And then look, look what it says in verse 24. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And by the way, that's what happened. A million Jews were slaughtered and every other one they could find, they sold, the Romans sold into slavery. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles. Now look at this ending. Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. When Jesus explained to his disciples the future, he built everything about the future around the city of Jerusalem. And he said that, that even the, the very end is determined by when the trampling of Jerusalem by the Gentiles is over. Then you know that God is moving into the next phase. Well, that's what we're going to look at this evening. And basically, uh, Jerusalem God says is the trigger, and by the way, it's, it's had a history of, of being a troublesome place. No city has been coveted and fought over as much as Jerusalem. Uh, among all the cities of the world, no city has been conquered, destroyed, conquered, destroyed, conquered, destroyed into the dozens of times like Jerusalem has. And as I said last week, there's really no reason. Uh, Jerusalem, the city of peace, was conquered by the Babylonians, the Macedonians, the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Persians, the Arabs, the Seljuks, the Crusaders, the Mongols, the Mamluks, the Turks, the British, the Jordanians, and that's only some of the conquerors. Even within that, there were subsets who, who worked. And their names have fluttered across the pages of its bloody history and anguished past. Jerusalem is a sacred city a city that has played a role in history totally out of proportion for either its economy, its size, or its strategic value. It's only because God so forcefully placed his name on that city. So this evening, I would just love to remind you, and I started this last week, that Jerusalem is God's timer. Now, Luke 21, 24, you see that. God says that after the destruction of Jerusalem, and that took place, I mean, very clearly, the Romans came, A.D. 70, you can look it up, it's a huge event in history. In fact, there's a carving of it in modern-day Rome that, that Titus, the general that conquered and, and decimated Jerusalem inside of this arch of his triumph, he has a relief. You, you can go there and stand and look up at the temple treasures being taken out. So that is a historic event. Jesus said that would launch a time period he calls the times of the Gentiles. So what are the times of the Gentiles that, that has Jerusalem as the center point of all of God's plans? Well, basically, the first period of Jerusalem's history, and, and there's a, a little picture of a little bit of the splendor of what Solomon's temple looked like. Remember David, the, the wealthiest man on earth, he had cornered the gold market. He had a million talents of silver and a talent of 60 pounds. So he had 60 million pounds of silver at 16 ounces a pound. That's almost a billion ounces. And with silver, I don't know what silver is these days, but I mean like, $12, I mean, that's $12 billion, cash, hard. That's not electronic, that was real. Then he had 100,000 talents of gold, which is 6 million pounds. And then just do the math there, and you're talking about just wealth like nobody else had. And he passes on to Solomon, so Solomon poured it into this most beautiful temple to any god ever created on the planet. And of course, it became a magnet, and in 586, it was destroyed. 
The second period of Jewish history is the second temple. That's Herod's temple. That's 40 acres you see in front of you. Uh, that's where uh, the, the epicenter of all of Christ's ministry when he was in Jerusalem and then the early church met on the right-hand side, that, that long portico is called Solomon's portico. Uh, the cleaning out of the money changers would have been at the kind of the orange roof deal with all the steps going up. Uh, that is what all the, the different times that we're reading about Jerusalem in the New Testament. It was here. But as I said, in AD 70, it was destroyed. That brings us to the miracle of what God has done preserving Israel all these years through all of the trampling of the Gentiles. And basically, the, the trampling of the Gentiles, which Jesus said there, would be centered on Jerusalem. And so let me just give you that, that history again. The Romans centered on there until 330 AD. Then the, the kind of the Christian Romans, the Byzantines, uh, were focused on Jerusalem building their monumental structures till 638 when the Persians came in. That's called the first Muslim period. And they stayed there till the Crusaders bumped them out in 1099. And then the, the, the later Muslim period, that's uh, the, the, uh, another portion of the, the Muslims from a different area. They were first from Persia, then they were coming from Egypt, then finally they end up coming from the Turkish period in the time of Martin Luther there, 1517. Then the British, as a byproduct of World War I, took over and kind of ran the place for 31 years. Currently, 1948, and the reason 1948 is there is because that's the first time that Jerusalem was a nation. And we're going to look at that and how that's spoken of in Ezekiel. But there's another period. After the trampling of the Gentiles, the Bible defines the next period as the tribulational period. And uh, that's where, and if you want to turn back to Zechariah, and you've seen this many times, but if you've never marked it, in fact, um, someone asked me today, they said, uh, uh, you know, would you help me mark these things so that I could, uh, you know, know how to defend what I believe? Well, this is a good marking time. Zechariah 14. Uh, there's a fourth period in God's plan, still future. It's the battle of Armageddon that will spill over into Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem is the center of the, the countdown that God has for the world. Now look what Zechariah writes in chapter 14, verse 2. And uh, I took the extra time to print out these verses for you because uh, it, it's, you know, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to see it. And it says, this is what God says, For I, this is the Lord God, Jehovah himself, I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem. Now, there is no reason why all of the South American and African and North American and Asian, no reason why they would all want to bother to go against Jerusalem. But God says, I'm going to gather them. I'm going to gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Interesting. God. Remember, God is watching over his word to make it happen. Because he said, this is what I have written down, this is my will, and I'm going to watch over it, and I'm going to cause the nations, all of them, to come, and the city will be captured, the houses will be plundered, the women will be ravished, half the city will be exiled, the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. That is the tribulational trigger. And that event of Jerusalem being taken causes the, the next two verses. Chapter 14, verses 3 and 4. And the tribulation is when all the nations of the earth turn against the Jews. And the Antichrist is leading that. Just think of the hatred, the vehemence, the, the anti-Semitism of Hitler and put that in a man who isn't just kind of spending all the money of Germany and pillaging all the loot of Europe. Someone that's running the whole world. That's what the Antichrist is. And so what the Lord does in verse 3 of Zechariah 14, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. That's the Armageddon scenario where the Lord Jesus Christ is, is at the front of the huge fan-shaped army of heaven where we will be all, it says, all the saints will be with him. So if you're a born-again believer, as a born-again believer, I will be behind him watching this. And it will be a very interesting battle. Not a shot will be fired. He speaks and they're gone. He just kills them. It's just a, kind of like a neutron bomb, you know. It's invisible and it just and and it it's terrible. You can read 
uh, Zechariah, what he does. It, it is like a neutron bomb. It says that people's, the enemy's skin will melt off of them just with the, you know, radiance of his glory. But he will go forth, fight against the nations when he fights on the day of battle. And in that day, and as he's coming, you know, Armageddon, the place, is actually 70 miles north of Jerusalem. It's over by, it's just kind of to the east of Haifa in the Megiddo Valley. But Jesus comes sweeping by there, wiping out those armies, heading to rescue Jerusalem, and he touches down right here. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem. So that's the fourth period. And then, of course, last week we talked about the fifth period, the millennial, and then finally the eternal. But we're not going to worry about that tonight. But let's, let's go to Ezekiel now, chapter 36, because I would like to give you a biblical... In fact, I heard the wonderful announcement about the new member class coming up. And if you went to the new member class, one thing you would see is that Calvary Bible Church has historically for 80 years stood for the literal grammatical interpretation of the scriptures, which you may have heard called the dispensational view, which is predicated on God making a clear distinction between Israel, the nation, and the church as the body of Christ. And that those two are not to be confounded, confused, intermingled, commingled, blended together, or replaced by one another. And that, that is a, a very clearly and dearly held uh, point of truth. But let me show you why. You know, because many people aren't from that background. If you're from uh, Presbyterianism, Methodism, Lutheranism, uh, all the branches of the Reformed Church or Catholicism, you were never brought up with that. Because that, historically, since St. Augustine in the 5th century has been, uh, you know, it was said, that's why Luther said, kill the Jews, there's no reason for them, you know, there's no future for them. It's, you know, too bad for Martin Luther. I mean, I'm glad he got everything else right, you know, and only made that mistake. You know, most of us make a lot more mistakes than that. But what Ezekiel says in chapter 36 is this. For all the centuries, since what we are going to read, starting in chapter 36, Ezekiel, a prophet, he was an exiled prophet. He actually, Jerusalem, in 586, way back in period one, you know, most people don't like history and dates, and it all runs together, but just Jerusalem, the temple, was destroyed 586 years before Christ. Nebuchadnezzar, you remember, you know, the fiery furnace and the lion's den, Daniel and all that. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, are the ones that came, but they came three times. They came in 605, took Daniel. They came in 597, took Ezekiel. They came in 586, wiped the place out and freed Jeremiah. So there's three people you've heard of. Daniel goes in 605, Ezekiel goes in 597, and Jeremiah is allowed out of the prison that the Israelites kept him in in Jerusalem in 586. So that's kind of a span of prophets. But Ezekiel, the one in the middle, in 597, was taken to Babylon. And he writes letters, prophetic letters, back to the people living in Jerusalem. And he wrote those letters between, in fact, his ministry... Uh, he was born about 623 B.C., and he died about 560 B.C., which those, you know, that's the Jewish chronology. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but the Jewish people have said that in the Encyclopedia Judaica. But what he talks about, and I'm going to show you here, never happened in his lifetime. Never. In fact, it's never happened for 2,600 years. In fact, Ezekiel describes Israel as being a valley filled with dry bones. Kind of think of Death Valley and think of some 20 mule team, you know, borax thing going and the mules all die and, and all the bones are bleached and just laying out in the desert. And that's the picture that Ezekiel sees of Israel. And so that's, that's what we're going to look at this evening. And this is what the Lord says. God God is looking over his word to perform it. And, and basically, I, I just, when I think about this, uh, there was nothing for 2,600 years to make Israel a target of what it talks about in Zechariah. Rome came against Jerusalem, but all the nations of the world, remember we just read that? Because there, there was not a nation to come against. 
There was no Israel to be the target of a coalition of Islamic nations or of all the nations of the world. When Ezekiel wrote in 600 BC all the way through to what we call the times of the Gentiles till 1948. By the way, that's why 1948 was way back on those slides. That's the end of the 2,600 years. In 1948, Israel, for the first time in 2,600 years, returned as a nation. There was no Israel nation from the time of Ezekiel all the way through till 1948, uh, which is only 65 years ago. I mean, it's amazing to think that for 2,600 years, the Scriptures slumbered along. God was watching over his word to perform it, and, and a lot of things happened. Uh, this, this is the, the basic overview that Ezekiel 36 and 37 give a series. I'm going to show you these, and, and you can mark them in your Bible. A series of little, little promises that God made for the nation of Israel. And if you look closely at their history, none of those promises came to pass until modern times. So I'll go through those with you. Number one, uh, the miracle of the rebirth of Israel. Uh, Ezekiel's bones grew into a living, breathing nation in 1948. And for centuries, Bible teachers had looked at Ezekiel 36 and 37. In fact, I, I collect, and, and I've told you this many times, and I'll never forget, my oldest commentary uh, that I have on the Bible was printed in 1610. Now, I know there's older ones, but it's the only oldest one I have. And, and when I read that, and when I look at what people are saying, when they looked at it, if they even bothered to look at Ezekiel 36, they said this obviously can't mean... Israel, because there was no Israel in the land of Israel. The Israelites were scattered all over. I mean, they were living in India. They were living in, in Persia. They were living all over Europe. I mean, they were the bankers of Italy. They were the bankers of, of Central Europe. They were just everywhere except there. Now, there was a handful. There's always been a handful of them that were diehards, and, and they lived next to the wall, and they would scrape away the dirt to try and touch it and pray near it. But there was never a nation in fact, Mark Twain went looking for him in the 1860s and 70s, and he couldn't find him, and he said it was a God-forsaken, desolate place, a swamp, he said, and it was fit for nothing, no human habitation. Well, then, as Ezekiel's bones grew into a living, breathing nation, God continued to watch over his word. What happened? Well, basically, in the late 1800s, people started talking about making a place for the Jews. Why? because the, the Russians were always having pogroms. You know what pogroms are? They would come in and they would drive the Jews right off their farms and they would kill them if they could get near them and they would burn everything and they'd throw them somewhere else. The Crusaders were doing that hundreds of years before the Russians. They just liked to pick on the Jews and if there was ever a problem in the town, you say the Jews did it and then you'd string up a few and, and confiscate all their property. That's just history. In fact, there are many, many books written on the the succession of pogroms and, and mini holocausts before Hitler. But in the late 1800s, finally, people started saying, we ought to make a place for the Jews. And you know who was saying it is? The British and, and others along uh, those veins of thought. And so what they, what they did is they, they allowed, the Turkish Empire allowed Jews to come in and start making little farms. But they taxed them heavily, and they weren't allowed to be a nation, and they just basically uh, made a lot of money off of them. But then, uh, when Hitler struck so savagely, and when the world, after 1945, and as the Life magazine photographers and other European magazines went in and showed the pictures of those emaciated, barely alive, skeletal Jewish people, sympathy, not love for God, but sympathy began to rise in people's hearts. And so Hitler was actually a, um, kind of like a precipitator of, of this movement, and the incomprehensible carnage caused the world to be moved to do something. So in 1948, the League of Nations that Woodrow Wilson and others had so valiantly worked on morphed into 1948, the United Nations. And in 1948, the United Nations kind of is a goodwill gesture at the behest of the Soviet Union. 
They're the ones that moved for this. They're the ones that, that thought they were going to have a foothold in the Middle East because they thought Israel was communistic because they had collective farms. And so many, and, and I don't know if you know anything about the makeup of modern Israel, almost half of all Jews living in Israel today are from Russia, just under half. In fact, uh, 13 of the last 14 prime ministers have been Russian immigrant descendants of Russian immigrant prime ministers of Israel. And so Russia thought they had an inside in the Soviet Union, and so they prompted in 1948, and the United Nations voted and established a homeland for the Jews, and the nation was named Israel. And in that short period of time, what happened in 1948 was, for the first time since Nebuchadnezzar, 2,600 years ago, for the first time in 2,600 years, there was actually a nation you could attack called Israel. Before that, there wasn't. It was part of Alexander's empire. It was part of the Roman empire. It was part of the Seleucid empire. It was part of all the different Muslim groups. It was part of the tug of war between the Turks and the British. And finally, it was the British mandate. But then in 1948, Britain moved out, and the Arab nation said, let them move out. Let them make them a nation. The day they become a nation, and you all know, this is history, all of the Arab League, all of the, the Arab nations began marching, and they said, we're going to drive every Jew into the ocean till they drowned. And the combined armies of all the surrounding nations, uh, you know, Iraq and Syria and Egypt and Jordan and Le all of them just started coming into the land, the little tiny strip of Israel. And you all know history. It was an unbelievable battle. They didn't win, the Jews. They just held off the combined armies of 100 million people, and there were only 3 million of them, which was kind of a David and Goliath thing. So the world, you know, wondered what was going to happen. Well, 50-plus years passed, and, and Bible scholars were looking at especially chapter 38, and they said 50 years from, from 1948 passed, and Iran Never, I mean, Iran was America's ally, and the Shah of Iran and the whole thing until 1979. And then it got a little dicey over there, but they never began to be talking about destroying Israel until about the last five or six years. And now, if you do Google news searches, you can't find a week going by where Iran doesn't say something about annihilate, exterminate, or whatever, Israel. And that's exactly what the Bible says. The God who watches over his word was waiting and directing the rulers of the world to do his bidding. That's why 1948 came. And now there's hardly any day that doesn't have some new item about Israel's annihilation and other nations now. I mean, Syria has started to say it too. And Hezbollah and the Muslim Brotherhood that is fighting right now in Egypt. And all of them say either they're going to do it with, with their missiles and their drones or whatever, or they're just going to do it with their armies. But... Why is everybody so against Israel? There have been more resolutions in the United Nations against them than any other nation on earth by a hundredfold. I mean, why does everybody hate Israel? Well, God has already described in detail what will happen in the future. And every time, what God has declared will happen always happens. And by the way, every time prophecy is fulfilled in the Bible, as in when Daniel was calculating, as when Jeremiah was calculating, as when each of the Old Testament prophets were calculating anything about prophecy, all of them happened literally, even down to Christ's birth. I mean, they didn't know what that meant. But when it happened, it was literally what it said would happen. And so God has a track record of literal fulfillment. And so when we examine closely those involved and see what the people of this world are saying, it's going to be fascinating to, to look at what the Lord has planned. Well, basically, the lesson tonight is we need to trust the God who wrote down in, I mean, and you can read these words, we'll look at them tonight, trust the God who told us in his word and promised Israel would return. Now, Jesus told us, but he told that 600 years after God had said it, God the, the Father had said it uh, through his spirit in the Old Testament. God the Son said it when he taught on earth. They were saying the same thing. 
that there's a future for Israel. So basically, what is that future? Well, in Ezekiel 36 and 37, you can get down to verse 10. I'm going to read it in just a minute. The God who rules the universe tells us that Israel will one day be reborn as a modern country. The Jews will pour back into the Holy Land after centuries of exile. The Jews will rebuild ancient ruins. I want you to think about that. If you go to Israel, they're naming all the places the same thing that they are in the Bible. Isn't that interesting that God said that all the ancient cities of the Bible would be rebuilt? And, I mean, they're very excited about it and doing it all the time. They would make the desert bloom like God promised. Israel would develop a vast and powerful military. It actually says that in the Bible, that Israel would develop a powerful military. By the way, who was Albert Einstein? A Jew? Yeah. How about uh, all the other atomic scientists that worked alongside of him? Who developed some of the most powerful weapons in the world? The Jewish Nobel Prize winners, they have a higher percentage of Nobel Prize winners per capita over all nations on earth. The Israelis do. God just, even in their unbelief, has remarkably blessed them. And finally, Ezekiel 38 tells us that Israel will become remarkably wealthy. If you've been listening to the news, isn't it fascinating that within the coastal waters that belongs, according to the whole world, to the nation of Israel, in the Mediterranean, just so far in the last two years, they've found 1.7 billion barrels of, of oil just off the coast of Israel, nicely placed. It would be nice if it was placed right off the coast of Egypt. They're starving down there. It'd be nice if it was placed right off the coast of Turkey because they're buying their stuff from everybody else. It'd be nice, it would help Italy if they had it right there because they're always in debt. You know what I mean? But isn't it interesting that in the whole basin of the Mediterranean, the first place they found unbelievably huge resources of, of petroleum products is right there. And it says that in the Bible that, that Israel, Ezekiel 38, 12, and 13, would be vastly wealthy. And a lot of people attribute it to banking, but it's, it's not. Well, here we go. Number one, here's God's first promise, and, and you look at it with me. Verses 10 and 11. God promised this, the return of the Jews after centuries in exile. Now, when did they get exiled? Well, their first exile was in the Babylonian time, but that only lasted 70 years. And then they came back, rebuilt their temple, and, and we know Zerubbabel, and we know Ezra, and we know Nehemiah, and we know that Haggai telling them that they should build God's house before they build their own houses, and all that's in the Old Testament. But they never became a nation. They, they were under the Greeks. Alexander came through. They were under, well, actually the Persians first, then the Greeks, then the Romans. And they were under the Romans all the way until they got under the Muslims. But they never were now under someone. But look what the Lord says. I will multiply men, verse 10, upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it. And the cities shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young, and I will make you inhabited as in former times, and do better for you than at your beginning. Now, now look at what it says in verse 36. In that 11th verse, it says, And then you shall know that I am the Lord. That is repeated and repeated and repeated. In fact, that's one of the themes of this book. It's repeated over 60 times. The whole purpose of what God is doing in Israel is so that Israel and the world will know who the real Lord is, that he is not Allah, that he is Jehovah. But here's, look at verse 12, same chapter, because it's the same theme. The return of the Jews after centuries in exile was promised by God. Therefore, prophesy, I say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people. Now look at this. You, you might have said, well, that was the return you know, in the time of uh, the Persians letting them out, or that was the return when Rome let a few of them back. But look what it describes, this return. I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. Did you know that's how the secular world looked at the death camps? When they, when they brought out those people that couldn't even walk out of Hitler's death camps, 
the, the commentators, the journalists said that it was like people coming out of the grave. And that, that, I don't think a, one of them ever had read Ezekiel 36. But God said this return is going to be when it looks like graves are opened and people come up from the graves. And this we're talking about the 40s now and bring you into the land of Israel. Look down at verse 21. Then say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. That has never happened until modern times. When the Babylonians came, only 50,000 of them wanted to leave. You look at the numbers in Ezra. Only 50,000 of the hundreds of thousands that were living in Babylon. It was too good to leave, Babylon was. That's why they're still living there. They're still in Iraq. They're still in Iran. There's still Jews in Iran, of all places. They're still living there. They don't want to leave. 50,000 of them came back to Israel. But look what the Lord says here. It's not just from one country. It says this, Surely I'll take the children of Israel, right in the middle of that verse, from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. This is describing the event of 1948. It's when the graves opened and when people started streaming in. I mean, they were riding rusty, leaking, sinking boats. They, would do, they used to run the boats ashore, aground on the shore, and the people would just swim ashore. They would do anything because finally there was a place in the whole world that was their land. Verse 22, and I will make them one nation in the land, in the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be over them all. No longer will they be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. And this is speaking of them becoming a nation. When did Israel become a nation? In 516, when they got out of Persia? No. Uh, how about in A.D., you know, the time of Christ, 30, were they a nation? No. Pilate, Roman procurator. They were occupied. When did they become a nation? With the, you know, the Byzantines? No, nope. the Romans still ran them. How about with the Muslims? Do you think the Muslims made them? No, nope. they were never. The Turks? No. They were never a nation until 1948. They never were a kingdom, a sovereign nation. Well, it doesn't end there. Look at chapter 38.8. This is another part of the promise. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many peoples on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. When the Jews began arriving in Israel, pre-World War II, the north was malaria-ridden. It was so infested with swamps and with all kinds of diseases that the, many of those early returnees died draining the swamps, trying to make this land come back. It was completely desolate. And by the way, the reason that Israel was desolate was the Turks had a great idea. You know, they were ruling from Turkey. They controlled Israel. And they said, we're going to make taxes simple. We're just going to tax you for every tree you have on your property. Every year, you know, five bucks or whatever it was for every tree on your property. Well, if you lived in Israel and you knew that you are in this land that, that the Turks ran that is now modern Israel, if you lived there and knew they were going to only tax you on trees, what would you do? And they did. They cut them all down. And that was the, the greatest blight to, and, and we're talking about from 1517 when the Turks instituted that, all the way through 1917, during those 400 years, Israel began to look like a wasteland. The, the mountains just, there was no forestation and the, it just washed all the topsoil off. In fact, when you go to Israel today, it looks just like the moon. I mean, it's, it's hardly, it's just rock. No topsoil, it's just rock, except in the valleys. And, and basically, which had long been desolate. See, when, when Jesus was walking around Israel, it seems like everywhere he walked, something was growing. He was, as he was talking, he was pulling off grain and eating it, and his disciples were getting in trouble, and everything is agricultural. It wasn't like that for centuries. It just became more and more desolate. And then it says, look at the end of that, they will be brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. Did the Jews dwell safely under the Persians? No, they murdered them. 
whenever they wanted to. The Persians did. Did the Turks, were they nice? No, they murdered them too. Were the Crusaders very nice? No, they killed any Jew they could find in Jerusalem when the Crusaders came through. Nice folks, you know. Uh, just go through the history. But look, now all of them dwell in safety. It's very interesting to think about. And then there's one more. Jeremiah, if you want to turn back, uh, Jeremiah 31, which is talking about the new covenant. That's what we were celebrating this morning. A little shocker is that God made the new covenant with Israel and we're allowed in. Instead of it being a replacement, it's us, the Bible says, True theology says in Romans 9, 10, 11 that Israel is the root and the trunk and we, Christ church, are grafted into Israel. Read Romans 9, 10, 11. It's not the church is the trunk and Israel is this little branch and we're going to clip it off. Israel is the root that the church is grafted into. And what's interesting is the new covenant in chapter 31 was given to to Israel, and Christ instituted it for his church. But look what it says in verse 7. Thus says the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob, shout among the chief nations, proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Look at verse 8. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. Did you know that just in the 80s, one million Russians migrated from Russia to Israel in the 80s, one million. We take tours over there every year. I mean, you couldn't go without running into a Russian. I mean, they were doing their little, you know, how they, they do that little dance with, you know, crouch down and kicking out their feet and they're playing their violins and they all are Russians. Look what this says. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, but not just the north country, verse 8 says, and gather them from the ends of the earth. Israel today has citizens from 100 other countries of the 180 on the planet. They have people from more than half of every country in the world. Is there any other place like that? There's only 6 million of them, and yet they represent more than half of all the countries. Now, what does the Bible say? I will gather them from the ends of the earth. Is there any other? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people living in New York, but they're there just to make money. You ask people like our guide, we always ask our guide in Israel, why did you come here? And he says, I don't know. I just wanted to. He said, I left a high-paying job to pick carrots on a kibbutz. He said, I left the security and comforts of, of the New York City area to live in a commune and work all day long and, and to, to break my back. But I said, why did you come? He says, because I felt inside that I wanted. He's Jewish. It's right here. I will bring them. Look what verse 8 says, from the north country. I'm going to gather them from the ends of the earth, among the blind and the lame, the woman with child, the one who labors with child. Great throngs shall return there. They shall come with weeping. You ought to see how these planes land in Tel Aviv. They come. They're bringing them. Even today, I mean, I get a little note every time a new plane, you know, and I, because I get the Jewish newspapers, and, and they show a picture, and the people come streaming down, and they just fall down at the bottom of the gangway coming off the plane, and they kiss the tarmac. I mean, why would you do that? Because they, they, they come with weeping and the supplications. They can't believe they're there. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way which they won't stumble. I am the father to Israel. Ephraim is my firstborn. Verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare in the far isles and far off, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. What happened since 1948? I know Israel's cocky, and I know Israel thinks that, you know, they've invented everything and they're best fighters in the world. But if you look, I, I remember when Billy Graham was preaching about, in the old days, the 1956 war in Israel and the 1967 war. Did you know that, that Israel was, was caught off guard in 1973, almost got defeated by the, the Muslim forces coming? But in every war, 48, 56, 67, 73, every one of those four great wars, Israel, even commentators would say, there's something supernatural about this, that, that they were able to defeat the, 
the combined armies of 100 million people, and there's only 3 million to start with, or actually 2, and then there was 3, and then there's 4, and then there's 5, now there's 6 million. But why is it? Because he, look at verse 10, who scattered Israel will gather them back. Now this isn't, by the way, I'm not reading from Hal Lindsey or Jack Van Empey or, you know, whoever, John Hagee. This is God talking. And he says, I am going to bring Israel back. I am going to shepherd them. Okay, Jesus also promised. Look at Matthew 24, and I want you to see uh, this is a second passage of Jesus' promise, and we'll get back to Ezekiel, but I want you to see Christ's orientation, and, and, and it really helps to see Ezekiel in light of this. The bottom line is, Jesus promised the rebirth of a nation called Israel. Now, of course, he promised it because he's the one that inspired the Old Testament. Peter says that all the Old Testament prophets, including Ezekiel and Jeremiah, spoke by the Spirit of Christ that was in them. So literally, you can say that, that the Spirit of Christ was speaking in the Old Testament. That's what the Bible says. But look what Jesus says in the New Testament. The bottom line is Jesus told us that when he returns, there will already have been a return of the wandering Jews back to their homeland. Jesus said that in Matthew 24. That jumps out clearly when you notice the orientation of Christ's words in verses 15 and 16. And this is what Jesus said. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, We've already looked at that. That's in chapter 9. He's taught, and by, no, it's not just in chapter 9. It's also in 11 and other spots, but clearly in 9. And Jesus said, you're going to know it's the end when the Jews are living back in their homeland when they have built a temple. Now, that's what gets interesting about this. How on earth, with tens of thousands of missiles pointed at Israel from every Muslim nation, how are they going to lift a finger up on the Dome of the Rock area. Something has to happen to offset the, the kind of trigger that's set right now. Well, Jesus says this. Standing in the holy place, that's the, the Hitron, the, the temple, the place uh, that was very clear. I mean, everybody that read this in the first century knew he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Whoever reads, let him understand. Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee the mountains. You know what the Lord said? He says, yes, the Romans are going to come, they're going to butcher everybody, they're going to put a trench around, they're going to siege, and they're going to destroy Jerusalem. But in the future, they're going to come back. They're going to live there. They're going to build their temple. They're going to inhabit biblical Judea. And he says that's going to be the sign of the, and you know we've already covered this, of the Antichrist. Okay, back to Ezekiel 36, or we'll never get done, and I know you want to go home because it's Labor Day and you want to celebrate. Um, Ezekiel 36, 36. Promise number two. Number one is they would return to their homeland. Number two, God says they would rebuild. They wouldn't just come back. They would rebuild the ancient ruins. And it says this. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I am the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. And, and what I think... Uh, is amazing is, do you think that the settlers, the early settlers who named their cities after the biblical sites that they were building on, were doing that because it said they were supposed to in Ezekiel? Do you think that the people that came to, to you know, all of the cities like Bethel, which is Bethel, or Caesarea, which is Caesarea, or any of the other little towns that have been Shiloh, which is Shiloh, do you think that, that they said, hmm, Ezekiel 36 says, we've got to rebuild the ruined places. These are in obscure places. And they search for them till they find where Shiloh was, where Bethel was. Where, and they just, they find where it was in the Bible times, and they plant what you hear on the news, a settlement there. Why are they doing that? Because God says, they are doing it because, look at the end of verse 36, I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Why, why is the whole world so upset that Israel is building these little towns in the land that is theirs that they conquered in battle? I mean, uh, do you think that we're going to give back, you know, the, what we paid all those 50,000 lives for in Korea that is now South Korea? We're going to give it back to China or Korea? I mean, it's fair and square. They won it. 
They're, we're defending it. But Israel won it. Nobody wants to defend it. Take it away from them. Don't build your cities. Why is everyone bothered by that? Because God says, I'm the one that's behind this settlement building stuff. I'm the one that wants the towns from the Bible rebuilt. But it doesn't stop there. It's very interesting. Third promise, God said, the reblossoming of desolate desert lands to produce abundant food. In chapter 36, look at verses 8 and 9. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches. You will yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. For indeed, I am for you. God said, I'm for you, Israel, even though all the other nations in the world aren't. I'm for you. I will turn you. You will be tilled and sown. And verse 30 continues, I will multiply the fruit of your trees. Now, Israel today supplies billions of dollars of fresh fruit and flowers to Europe and the Arab world. They have to remark the boxes because none of the Arabs will buy it from Israel, but if they put some other word on there, they'll buy their apples. Isn't that funny? And, and what is amazing is the land of Israel side by side where the Jewish farmers are farming, it, is, it looks like Florida's old citrus groves before they all died from whatever bug got them. And it looks like California used to look before they knocked all the trees down and built houses over it. That's what Israel looks like today. And you know what's interesting? You can have uh, a, a Muslim farmer and you can have a Jewish farmer and the, the Jewish farmer with his drip irrigation in the middle of the desert, it looks just like the Garden of Eden and the poor Muslim farmer's farm looks just like it used to look, just like nothing. But then the Muslim farmer comes to the Jewish farmer and says, could you show me how to do that? And can you believe it? They go, yeah, I'll sell it to you. And they sell them, and all of a sudden the Muslim farm, using the Jewish technology, begins to just beautifully produce billions of dollars of fruit. Did those agricultural engineers, those irrigation pioneers, those desert scientists devote their lives to Israel, turning it from a wasteland condition to make it Ezekiel 36, 8, 9, 30? Do you think that all those drip technology engineers did it because they said, hmm, verse 9, you will be tilled. Verse 30, I'm going to increase the fruit of your trees. That's why I'm doing it. No. It's because God promised and he causes it. Well, real quickly, look at chapter 37 of Ezekiel. Just some more. Here's a fourth promise. This one's interesting. God said, I'm going to create in Israel an exceedingly great army. Now, I keep mentioning, you know, there are 7 billion people in the world. Israel just hit 7 million. That means one out of every thousand people live there on the whole planet Earth. But look what it says in Ezekiel 37. God says, so I, prophes so I prophesied as he commanded me. Ezekiel is the I, God is the he. So Ezekiel prophesied as God commanded him. And breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. Now, it's very interesting, the word that's used there. And I ask you this, did the atomic scientists and the military weapon engineers that have devised nuclear weapons, the neutron bomb, and the finest and only 99% accurate anti-missile defense system in the world, which you read about in the news every day, called Iron Dome. I mean, even us Americans, we don't have that. I mean, we have our arrow thing, but lob a few motor, mortars at our soldiers, and we won't blow them up. We can't yet. We're trying to buy the technology from Israel. But those little six million people, God, for some reason, has given them such genius. Do you know what it's like to get a projectile coming that you didn't know when it was going to come, and you track it, and you triangulate it, and you find out whether it's going to hit a field with plants or if it's going to hit a house with children? And you do that in less than 10 seconds. And, in the meantime, you shoot something to meet it and destroy it before it hurts anything. Amazing, the technology they have. No, they weren't doing it because Ezekiel said it. Those scientists were just trying to protect themselves, defend themselves, and make a living. But in the process, Israel has become the third or the fourth most powerful military in the world. 
How many nations have atomic weapon submarines? Thankfully, not very many. U.S., Russia, France, England, Israel. Now, recently, India, you know, bought a Soviet one. China bought a Soviet one. And, but who, who, has the, who can do it on their own? They're an exceeding great army because God is watching over them. Well, before we go, and we'll pick up here next week, we need to trust the God who describes Russia as the leader of the anti-Israeli coalition that's described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Look at 38.8. After many days you will be visited. And this isn't a good visit. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword. This is Israel, brought back from the sword of all the pogroms all over the world and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. We're talking about the same thing. And were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. So here's Israel back in the nation and look what happens. 38, 1 through 6. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. Now Gog is kind of like Pharaoh. Pharaoh is not his name. If you went with Joseph and says, I'm looking for Pharaoh, you're, you're talking about a title. Gog is a title. It's not a person, their name is G-O-G. -G. It's, it's a person that is a title, like Pharaoh. They're like the president, you know. Our president's name is not president, it, you know, it's Barack Obama. It's not president. You can call him president, but that's not his name. It's a title. That's what Gog is. But he's of the land of Magog, and he is the prince or the ruler of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, verse 3, thus says the Lord God, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around. I will put hooks in your jaws. I will lead you out in your army and your horses and your horsemen, all splendidly clothed, the great company with bucklers and shield, all of them handling swords. Verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. Those three nations never contemporaneously ever were armed and attacking Israel any time. Persia did. The Ethiopians came up with a million-man army, but now while Persia was in existence. You understand that, that, this, that this is a historic event in Libya with them and all their shield and helmets, and not just them, but Gomer and his troops, and the house of Tugarma in the far north and his troops, and many people with you. We'll pick up there next time because when you see, and wait till you see, and I, it's going to be interesting, when you see a map and you overlay it with Herodotus, the father of history, he was contemporary with Ezra. He lived 500 years before Christ. He names all these places that are named here because Ezekiel was living in the same time period. And Herodotus, a Greek historian, tells us where all these Gomer and Meshach are. And when you look at that on the map, you know what it looks like? It looks like the New York Times. Because exactly the nations today that are rattling their sabers and saying, destroy Israel. For the first time in history, every one of them are exactly lined up with what Ezekiel 38 says. Jerusalem is God's timer for the end of the world. And if you understand the fight for Jerusalem, you understand the God who made all these promises and is causing his word to come to pass. Well, at 713, let's all stand if you still have blood and circulation. And as we stand, before I close, uh, oh, Mr. Altoff, do you want to come and close us in prayer? Do you mind? Come on. We don't mind you crying. Come on. Or I'll take you my microphone. We just miss you. You're a blessing. I stopped two minutes early. Come on. After all these years, and uh, as John closes, let's just pray for safety. Can you tell us when is the car leaving and where are you headed and all that? We pack on Friday and we drive on Saturday and we unpack on Sunday and I start work on Monday. So you can pray for that. <laughs> Amen. And you pray for us. All right. Father, thank you for making us a uh, family in Christ. And I just thank you for the, the blessing of the years, uh, getting to grow here and uh, with... Um, with this family and just continue, the, continue to ask, Lord, that you will be faithful as you always have been to, uh, to make them a light here in Kalamazoo as we continue to wait for your return. And we ask all this for your glory in Christ's name.
Amen. Amen.